we're in a message series, and I'm kind of moving toward the end of it, and we're talking about matters of the heart. And today we're going to look at the idea of a broken heart and a shattered heart. And as we look at this, we're going to be opening into Psalm 34. And when you go to Psalm 34 and you begin to understand what's going on here, you need to, you need to catch a little bit of the background to better be able to draw the truth that's being presented here. In 1 Samuel chapter 21 and 22, David had been over in the land of the Philistines. And while he's in the land of the Philistines, he had um, kind of been behind enemy territory, if you will, and in their area. And so they, they have him and are bringing him before the king. And as he's getting ready to go before the king, he's thinking, man, I'm really getting myself in a pickle. Now, he's thinking, what do I do to be able to get out of this? So what he does to get out of it, he thinks quickly, leans on God, gets this idea real quick. I tell you what, I'm going to act like I'm losing my mind. Have you ever played like that? Um, maybe, you, you know, you, you, you're just kind of, you're going to kind of duff it and mail it in a little bit or something. Don't want people to know what you know, really. And so... He, he started writing on the door frames, which was kind of unusual, and then he started drooling in his beard. Now, that's bad. And so he was having these things happen, and uh, when he gets before the king, the king says, what'd you bring me a madman for? I have enough mad people in my life already. Do you have enough mad people in your life already? If you do, say yes. Yes, you know you do. And so he said, don't bring me another whacked out situation. I don't want to deal with it. Send him away. So he sent him away. It worked. But then what David is talking to us about when he comes into this passage is when he moves through it, as he gets down toward the latter part, he's talking to us about what happens when you have a broken heart, when you have a crushed spirit. And some of us sitting here have experienced those type of moments in our life, broken hearts, crushed spirits. And so we identify a little bit with what he is saying because we could slot our own reality, our own situation into what he's saying here. But if you open up into the first part of this chapter, notice what he says when he starts out in this chapter. I will bless the Lord, extol, lift up, magnify the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Amen? My soul will make its boast in the Lord and the humble will hear about it and they'll be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, he says. Elevate him. Put the spotlight on him. Focus on him. Magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together, everybody. Then he says, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me, very personal, and he delivered me, notice what it says, from all my fears. Doesn't stop there, does it? Continues on. You know what else it says? The angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear him. You know what that means? That means he's all around, seeing everything, knowing everything, able to be aware and overpower anything. God above, God below, beside, beneath, in front, behind. Oh man, we're talking God everywhere. And then he talks about an analogy here. He said, um, come and taste and see. Whew, it's almost lunchtime. I'm just saying. I can almost smell the grill. Oh, mm, you can smell it in the oven. It's got your name on it. It's, it's a bunch of goodness. And you're excited about it. He said this, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Wow, he's really bragging on the Lord here. He's excited. He's kind of having a, a shouting spell. He's kind of having a praise testimony time here. He's saying, wow, hallelujah. He is all excited about this. But then he tells us why he's this way. And he tells us life isn't always real awesome. And so he says, I want to help get your perspective where it needs to go. So if you're in a situation right now, where what you see is your big, crushing, heart, mind problem going on, he says, I want you to know that there is another way to look, and this is a way that you can look toward God. And when you look toward God, you're going to be able to advance through whatever the situation is that your life has thrown at you. And the fact of the matter is, all of us at some time or other, and some of you right now, need this type of of explanation of the scripture because it serves as a reminder to lift you up in the midst of whatever is going on to where your perspective gets set in a readjusted way. Look at verse 12 through 15. He said, we should live remembering to reverence God. I believe David as a young boy learned what it was to reverence God. When the prophet came to his house looking for someone that was going to be anointed as a future king, 
They came to the house and looked at all the big, strong, mighty brothers, and they said, well, the prophet said, it's not, it's not any of them. Do you have any more? <laughs> it's a footnote out in the field. Go get the footnote. Little David, little old incidental David didn't even think to bring him in. Oh, well, yeah, I got it. Go get him, little incidental. You may be incidental in your family, but you are not incidental to God. He brings you in from the field and he stands there and looks at you and says, I want you. I pick you. You're the one. And old David, I just think there's something about this business of reverence before God that became awakened in his heart as a young kid. And it continues on whenever he's out in the field watching the shepherd, uh, the sheep, as a shepherd. As he is out here, he kills the lion. He kills the bear. He corrals the sheep. He's thinking about this. He gets his pen. He starts writing. The Lord is my shepherd. You notice that little word? Two letters, is. He didn't say the Lord was my shepherd. He didn't say the Lord could be my shepherd. Do you see the present tense of that? The Lord is my shepherd. When you go into Psalm 46, he didn't write it, another did, but you look at that. God is our refuge. Present reality. I think he learned something in his heart, in his mind, about this business of reverencing God, about this business of understanding who God was. And he explains what reverencing God means in this context. Look at verse 12. He unpacks it. He says, to reverence God means you're going to have a controlled tongue. That is, you're going to be free from evil and free from deceit. You're not going to do that. Look at verse 14. You're going to live a life that is a separated walk. It is to avoid evil and it is to do good. Look at verse 14. You're going to live where it is possible in this reverencing God peacefully with all people with a peaceful disposition. Romans, Paul says it this way, chapter 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. This is what he says. So to live in reverence before God every day means when I go sit down and negotiate the deal with the people at the office, I'm going to live with the awareness that God is with me, in me, for me. In this moment, I'm going to live with that integrity, with that reality, with that awareness. When I'm living in my marriage, I'm going to live this way. Whenever I'm doing those final exams, I want to live this way with the awareness that God is with me. I want to tell the truth. I want to live the truth. I want to have the awareness of God before me all the time. So David understood the business of having reverence before God. And even when he was over there before Abimelech, he wanted to have the awareness that though he's got drool coming down here, really deep in his heart, he is very much so aware of God and he's leaning into God. So I want to encourage you, whatever situation you're in right now, to adjust your vision just a scooch, just a little bit, and turn your head a little bit toward God. And allow your eyes to begin to realize God is really there after all. Hasn't forgotten you. Can come behind enemy lines. Is bigger than the situation you have in your present reality. You say, Kev, I don't have much energy. I don't have much. I don't have much. Man, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure, man. I don't know. Let me just say this. Adjusting just a little degree can make a big difference in your destiny. If you adjust just a little bit of your habit, just a little bit of your thinking, just a little bit of the way you're talking, it begins to help you move toward the awareness of God. This is absolutely powerful. I notice something else that happens here. Look at verse 15 and verse 17. The righteous not only have this reverence that's happening about them, but we also have an incredible privilege of the audience with God. Look at verse 15. God's eye is on you. Now, guys, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had your eye on a girl? It is kind of like, woo, she's fine. Uh-uh. Mm. You just kind of had your eye on this girl, you know? You're kind of thinking, man, she's something. I wonder if she'd like me. Uh, let me ask you this. Have you ever had your eye on a car? You want to buy a car or a motorcycle? Lawnmower. You fixate a little bit. You get your eye on that. You just want to have that. Or maybe you just want to get, uh, you know, some kind of an outfit and you've been thinking about, well, 
you just kind of, you know, if you're thinking about a car, you've gone online, you're shopping around, you see it's there. It's like, wow, you kind of go through the inventory of what all's there and you're looking at it and then I got to drive by. So you get in the car and you go by and you look at it and whoa, I'm going to take a little picture of this. And you get somebody else to take a picture, you stand there and say, isn't this cool? And then you, you've got all this stuff going on and pretty soon, what's happening with this? What's happening with this? You are fixated with this. God has his eye on you. God. Creator of the universe, maker of the ocean, maker of the mountains, maker of the trees, the birds, the fields. He has his eye on you. You haven't escaped his view or his reality. Notice verse 17 says, God's ear is attentive to us. He hears us laugh, sigh, moan. He hears our heart, our mind. He knows our thoughts. The psalmist puts it this way in 139 and 2. You know, when I sit and when I rise... You perceive my thoughts afar off. Look at verse 17 of your passage. God hears your cry. God, I need help. Or God, I need help. He hears your cry. And he knows where you are. And he knows what's going on. Now some of you get roped into watching the Hallmark Channel. Just let that soak in. And at Christmas time, you probably saw the story about Mr. Finley's department store. It was having trouble. And he has a young adult son who is uh, running the toy department. And the store is having struggles and it's kind of going down. Mr. Finley, the owner, is wanting to eventually give the store to his son. He's not real happy with life because they're headed toward Christmas time. And at Christmas, his wife had died a number of years before. And so he's got that gnawing awareness of that and it depresses and discourages him. So he doesn't like Christmas and so he quit having the Christmas party and all that. Well, there's an angel, Miss Merkel and Miss Miracle, who has been sent and she works in the toy department. But she's there to draw the dad and the son together and to wake up their hearts to Christmas again. And the toy department starts to take off. Ooh. And the young son starts to perk up and think better thoughts. Ah. And Ms. Merkel and Mr. Finley are standing on the street corner waiting on his car to come by and she's waiting on the bus. And as his car pulls up, he says, I don't believe I know you. And she says, oh yeah, it must be a mistake, some mistake from HR. I don't know your name. Let me tell you, God knows your name. Nudge your neighbor and say, God knows your name. Now let that sink in just a minute. Your counselor knows your name. Your doctor knows your name. Your family knows your name. Your neighbors might know your name, might not. Your friends know your name. At least your first name, or hey you, how you doing? But your creator knows your name. You have an audience with him. Third thing I want to point out, we have reverence, we have an audience. Verse 17 and 19 says it this way, The righteous cry out to God, and he helps us. David says in verse 19, We may have many afflictions, and he'd had a lot. You may have a lot. Some of you have them right now. Stresses, disappointments. We cry out to God for help. Help, God, where are you? In the Old Testament, Micah 7 and 7 says it this way. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. There's a burden I have outside the church. A situation I'm praying about and praying for. It's a heavy burden I've carried for several years along the way. And I pray to God about it. I ask God for strength and courage and for favor and for blessing and for help with the situation. And I ask God to help me adjust my reality and what he wants me to know and see is it's not my specific situation, but it's a burden I carry. And this verse helps me. I wait for my God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Look what he says in verse 17. The righteous cry out. That's us. We cry out and the Lord hears them. When I was a little kid, Farrah Fawcett was a very big name. Charlie's Angels. Oh my goodness. 
She hit the big screen. She was big time. A lot of you probably that lived in the 80s did your hair in a fair faucet way just to be cool with the big hair. And you remember that era. But if you saw the documentary that was on main channels this week, you saw something about her and got to see another side of her. When she was 60, 61, 62, she was diagnosed with cancer and it was very aggressive, very mean. The treatments weren't always friendly and kind to her body. As a matter of fact, they were very rude to her and rude to some of us when we would battle different things. They finally went in the latter part of that, which is really the only part I got to see, but the latter part of that, they showed, they showed her going back to her home, meeting up with her father, and she says, Dad, I know God's busy, but when's he going to do something for me? When's he going to do something for me? And the dad says, well, I know he knows about you because I keep going to him all the time. And I keep telling him about you all the time. Let me tell you something. God knows about you. God knows exactly what's going on with you. And he knows about your Philistine experience when you're over there drooling in your proverbial beard and you're writing doofy on the walls. He knows about you. And he knows what's going on in that moment. And he hears your cry. He may not answer you in a way you want. But he is there nonetheless. One writer puts it this way. How long must I endure sickness? How long must I endure this spouse? How long must I endure this paycheck? The writer said, do you really want God to answer? He could, you know. He could answer you in terms of the now and time increments we know. Two more years of the illness, rest of your life with your marriage. Ten more years for the bills. But he seldom does that. Can I get a witness in the house? You know that's right. He usually opts to measure the here and now against the there and then. And when you compare this life to that life, this life ain't that long. Can you handle one more? If you can, say yes. Yes. All right, 16 and 18 said it this way. The brokenhearted and crushed spirit is irresistible to God. God can resist the proud all day long. As a matter of fact, in James it says it this way in 4 and 6, it said God resists the proud. When we bow our neck against God and say, you don't know what you're doing, we're going to do it our way. You're not that cool, you're just another little something over here. No, we marginalize God and we bring him down to our size and put him as a little image over here. God isn't impressed with that. As a matter of fact, he says he resists the proud. Later on he says he does away with them. Does away with them. But notice in verse 18, God cannot resist those with a broken heart and a crushed spirit. Did you see that? He can't can't resist them. David was dependent on God to help him get away from the Philistine more than once, wasn't he? And do you remember that time when over in Acts chapter 7, it talks to us in the New Testament about Stephen whenever he was being killed with stones for his faith? He was being stoned for his faith. Do you remember what happens in heaven? The scripture opens up heaven a little bit and gives us a little picture. Do you remember what happened? Jesus is standing there to welcome him in as the first person who died for his faith and trusting in Christ. He cannot turn away from the crushed heart, the crushed spirit. (laughs) That's the God that you serve. God is for you. Your parents may have forgotten you, Lucato says. Your teachers may have neglected you. Your siblings may have be ashamed of you. But within reach of your prayer is the maker of the oceans, God. Verse 21 and 22 tell us in the end we win. Look at what it says in verse 22. Condemnation is removed from the righteous. None of us were righteous at the beginning, but we called out to God and through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we've been made right before God. Amen? And as we have trusted in Him and His righteousness has been applied to us, He's cleansed us. In our mind, He has renewed us. In our heart, He is transforming us. In our life, He's making us like Christ. And this is absolutely wonderful. How He does this is a miracle within itself. But He does. And wow, when He does, it's awesome. And we begin to realize, wait a minute, I have no condemnation in my heart.
we used to sing a song, No Condemnation, Now I Dread. Jesus and all in Him is mine. <sighs> We're made right before God, justified before Him. This is powerful. So we're ready to live this life and we're ready to die if he wants us out of this life. I conclude with these thoughts. Sarah Young, a writer, I'm reading from a devotional book of hers. She writes as if she's God talking to you. She says this, Approach each new day with a desire to find me. Find me before you get out of bed. Some mornings we don't wake up feeling all good, do we? I have already been working to prepare the path you will get through this day. There are hidden treasures strategically placed along the way. Some of the treasures are trials designed to shake you free from earth's shackles. I didn't like that part very much, but I keep reading. Others are blessings that reveal my presence, God is saying. Sunshine, flowers, birds, friendship, and answered prayer. I have not abandoned you in this sin-wrecked world, I'm still richly present in it. That's comforting. Then she wraps with these two sentences. Search for deep treasure as you go through this day. You will find me all along the way. So as we come to the table of communion, we look back and give thanks to God for what He has done. The death on the cross. Christ died for us, shed His blood for us. And we trust in Him as our Savior. We look at what He's doing within. He is transforming us. He has forgiven us. He has made us right before God. And we listen to Him when we look within. And if He says, hey, as the psalmist says, find if there be a guilty way in me. If He points something out, confess it to Him. And then we look ahead with great eager anticipation to the day when He returns and calls us to Himself. Man, we have a bright future. We're on the winning team. If God is for us, really nothing can be against us. Through Him, we overcome. Amen.